This is our last video for chapter two, and we are going to talk about the elementary properties of a group. So again, this isn't how to check if something is a group. We're going to talk about uniqueness of identities, the cancellation property, and so forth. So there's a lot of proof in this video. So we're going to prove these properties, but also it's just good proof practice in a very proof heavy course. So the first property we're going to look at is the theorem of cancellation. And there are two theorems of cancellation, one on the right and one on the left. So we're going to uh, prove the one on the left, and then you could just repeat the same process for the one on the right. So the theorem says in a group G, the right and left cancellation laws hold. The cancellation law essentially says that if BA equals CA, that implies that B equals C. And if AB equals AC, that also implies that B equals C. So essentially, the way that we're going to go about this proof is we're going to be multiplying by canceling these A's out so that we can show that B is equal to C. But obviously, we can't just cancel A's out. We need to be doing this mathematically correctly. Now, before we start the proof, I want to set up the way that uh, you should be looking at proofs in my class and in general. So. Um, it's a good idea, especially when you're just getting started with proofs or when you're not super comfortable with mathematical proof, to include a what to show. So you should start with that. A what to show statement is essentially going to be an implication, an if P then Q statement. Now, if you haven't taken discrete math and you don't know what I'm talking about with if P then Q, don't worry. This is just logic. We're saying, if we can show that some statement is true implies some other statement is true and that logically will show what we're trying to prove so if i can show that that implication exists then i've proven what i've set out to prove so in this case remember we're trying to prove either this statement or this statement now we're going to choose the second one and this is going to be the left cancellation law. So we're saying if AB equals AC, then B equals C. So this one was easy to write the what to show because it sort of already gave it to us. It says this implies this. So that's my what to show. Now, I'm not going to do the right cancellation law, but you will you can see when we get finished, it would be exactly the same just on the right side. Now, what I have found is if you're able to come up with that what to show correctly, the rest of the proof is going to flow much more easily for you. And the given or the beginning of our proof should be exactly what the hypothesis of that implication is or the left hand side, the P uh, proposition. So if a equal, AB equals AC, notice my proof starts with let AB equal AC. Now, I'm also going to throw in there that A prime is the inverse of A. Um, technically, I wouldn't have to include that because it's implied that if I have A inverse, that it's going to be the inverse of A, but I'm just going to be very clear and say that A inverse is the inverse of A. So when you're doing the actual proof part, then of course, I'm starting with the given, and then I'm going to try to give a reason for every step that I take. So I'm going to say by multiplication, oops, multiplication on the left. So again, when we multiply, we just, we're not just willy nilly. We have to multiply both on the left or both on the right. By A inverse, we have a inverse AB equals A inverse AC. So again, I've multiplied on the left by A inverse. By the associative property, we can say A inverse AB is equal to A inverse AC by the properties or by the property of an inverse a a inverse sorry 
a a inverse equals a inverse a equals e so e b equals e c and therefore by the property of the identity, because obviously E is the identity, B equals C, because the property of, of the identity, and again, you can include that property, property of the identity. Um, so I'm going to make this very, very um, clear, which tells us um, E B is equal to B, we know B equals C. So again, I've done a little bit extra here. So I'm saying um, the property of the identity tells us this, the inverse tells us this. So I've included stuff that maybe isn't necessary, but I find it's never bad to include extra information. It's always bad to not include enough information. So this is a, a very clear proof of the theorem of cancellation. And again, we could do the exact same thing on the right side. It would be the exact same proof. The next property is the uniqueness of identity. And the uniqueness of identity says essentially that there's only one identity element in a group. Now, before we get started on this particular um, proof, I do want to point out that uniqueness proofs often assume two of something and then set out to prove that those two somethings must be the same. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. I am trying to show that there's only one identity. So I'm going to assume that there are two identities and then prove those identities are the same element. So you might be thinking, where did she come up with what to show? Because that's a really difficult thing to do. Well, I used the fact that a uniqueness proof will often assume two of something to show that those two things are the same, and I used the definition of an identity element. So I have the definition of the identity element that says if A equals A for all of G. So this is the definition of an identity, that A E equals A, and in fact, you could say A, sorry, A E equals E A equals a for all a elements of g so that's essentially the definition of an identity and i'm saying a is an identity and i'm saying i'm sorry e is the identity and also e prime is the identity so i'm basically saying there's two identities and then i'm trying to prove that that shows that e and e prime must be the same so the good news is we're going to use the cancellation law that we just proved, which is going to make this proof very straightforward. So my given, I could just say, let E and E prime be inverses. So I don't need to rewrite all of this because I do have it up here on the what to show. So I can either say, let them both be inverses, or I can rewrite it just as I did. So I can say, since A, E, equals a and a e prime equals a then by substitution a e equals a e prime by left cancellation which we just proved so now i don't have to reprove it by left cancellation e is equal to e prime so i could go through the whole rigmarole and show that a inverse a e is equal to a inverse a e prime and that gives me e e equals e e prime and then e equals e prime but do i have to no because i just proved the left cancellation law holds that says if you have the same element on the left side you can cancel it and that is what i have done so this part obviously is the longer way and then you would give a reason for each of those steps but i'm just going to say by left cancellation 
The next property is also a uniqueness um, property, the uniqueness of inverses, essentially saying that each element, so before we were talking about the identity, um, there's only one identity in a group, but in this case we're saying for each element A, there's one unique element B, such that AB equals BA equals E. So just as we did in our last uniqueness proof, we're going to assume, and again, this is really just the definition of an inverse. So we're going to assume that B is an inverse, and we're going to assume that C is an inverse, and we're going to then prove that those two inverses must be the same. So again, my given could be rewriting the left-hand side of the implication, or I can say, let B and C be inverses of element A in G. So what's my proof going to be? Um, since A, B equals E and A, C equals E, then A, B equals A, C. Guess what we're going to do now? By left cancellation, which we've already proven, I'm just going to cancel that A. We know B equals C, which is what I was trying to prove. This last theorem is called the socks shoes property, and you will be surprised at how often you're going to use this one. Uh, you won't have to prove it more than once, but you will um, use it often in other proofs. So this one says for group elements A and B, A, B, um, the inverse of A, B is equal to B inverse times A inverse. So what to show is essentially for all A, B that are in G, that that is in fact true. So what's my given? Just that I have two elements A and B. So what's my proof? Well, since an element times the inverse of that element is equal to E, and remember what I'm trying to show, that this element, AB inverse, is equal to B inverse A inverse. And so all I'm going to do is do some math with B inverse A inverse. And hopefully by the time I'm done, I end up at E. So let's take a look and see if we can get there. So if I have AB times B inverse A inverse, then I can rewrite that with the associative property as A, B, B inverse, A inverse, which gives me A, E, A inverse, which gives me A, A inverse, which gives me E. So we have A, B, a B inverse equals A B, B inverse A inverse by left cancellation A B inverse is equal to B inverse A inverse. So that's all for the proofs for this section, but we did want to talk about just one more need to know, and that is talking about the notation for a multiplicative group versus an additive group. So a multiplicative group where the operation is multiplication, obviously we will be written in either way that we are familiar with multiplication, whereas the operation for an additive group would obviously be to add. Looking at the identity, the identity for a multiplicative group is usually written E or 1, whereas the identity for an additive group is 0. If you add 0 to something, you end up back where you started. For inverses, um, A inverse is the way that we're going to denote that. Remember that means 1 over A, which makes sense because if I took A times 1 over A, I would get back to the identity, which is 1. Whereas the inverse for an additive group is negative A. Again, 
5 plus negative 5 would give me 0. For powers or multiples, we would say a to the nth power as opposed to n times a. And then for division or quotient or difference, we're looking at a b inverse. Remember that's a times 1 over b, which would be a divided by b, and or a minus b for a difference. So a typical question you might get related to the two notations is to rewrite the multiplicative expression into additive or vice versa. So if I were looking at the multiplicative expression, let's just look at the a b squared first. a b squared by itself, if I were rewriting it, would just be a plus 2b. But because we now have this negative 3, still in multiplicative notation, let's write that as a to the negative 3, b to the negative 6, and then c squared equals e. So this is still multiplicative notation, but notice what I've done is I've distributed um, the exponent. So a to the negative 3 and b squared to the negative 3, which would we would multiply those two values. So now rewriting it in additive notation, this negative 3 exponent would become negative 3a, and then negative 6 exponent would be minus 6b, so minus 6b, and then the positive 2 would make it plus 2c, and then what is the identity in the additive group? Not e, but 0. So this would be my revised expression. The last example I want to go through with you has to do with group properties of exponents. So it has to do with exponents, but also with um, the inverse. So what we have is we have a group and a, if we perform a five times, we get back to the identity. And if we perform b seven times, we get back to the identity. We want to rewrite a to the negative second, b to the negative fourth without using negative exponents. So how are we going to do that? Well, first we're going to say this is the same as a inverse squared. So essentially taking out that negative exponent. And this is the same as b inverse to the fourth. So that leads us to the question, what is a inverse? Well, a inverse means what am I going to take times a to get back to e? Well, I know that I would have to take a times a to the fourth to get a to the fifth, which is the identity. So I'm going to replace a inverse with a to the fourth. And in the same way, looking at b to the seventh is equal to e. So what is b inverse? b inverse is going to be what would I take times b to get seven b's. So I would need six more b's to get seven b's. So that would be b to the sixth to the fourth. From here, I'm going to go ahead and use the normal um, property of exponents that says this is a to the eighth, four times two, uh, the power of a product, I believe, property, um, b to the 24th. And then from here, what I'm going to do is essentially take out groups of five a's. So if I have a to the eighth, that's essentially like a to the third times a to the fifth. And if I have b to the seventh, that's like b to the seventh and b to the seventh and b to the seventh and b to the third. Well, a to the third is great. a to the fifth is e. b to the seventh is e. b to the seventh is e. b to the seventh is e and b to the third is b to the third. So how do I rewrite it as a to the third, b to the third? We're going to move on now to chapter three and we will begin by looking at subgroups. We will start by looking first at the terminology and notation that we will need to be successful throughout the rest of the chapter.